Harry signs amended deep offshore act into law. Important day for Nigeria, especially like the young people. Yes. Promise to be exciting for industry, trade, and commerce in Nigeria, especially with the coming into force of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. Vice President Yemi Oshibadu opens Nigeria Canada Investment Summit, assures investors of conducive business environment. It's only fair that we do that, give them what is due to them. Solution to the payment of severance allowances to legislative aides of the 8th Assembly in sight, as Senate President meets with the Finance Minister. The Excellency has also demonstrated his determination to prioritize creating a Yobe state. Yobe state government donates 30 vehicles as in the Inspector General of Police launches Operation Desert Intervention. Hello and welcome to the Network News. I am Muhammad Kudu Abubakar. Also on the news tonight is Michael Olale in Lagos and Zule Mohammed is in Kaduda. President Muhammad Buhari today in London signed the amended Deep Octo Act recently passed by the National Assembly. The amended act is expected to generate at least $500 million additional revenue for the federal government. Ruth Aguile packaged that report and now here she is. While signing the amended act, President Buhari was quoted by the senior special assistant to the president on medium publicity, Garwa Sheho, as saying, Today is an important day for all Nigerians, particularly the young generation. He said Nigeria will now receive its fair, rightful and equitable share of income from her own natural resources for the first time since 2003. When oil prices began a steep increase to double and at times triple over the following decade. President Buhari noted that all this time, Nigeria has failed to secure its equitable share of the proceeds of oil production as all attempts to amend the law on the distribution of income had failed. Now, despite rapid reductions in the cost of exploration, extraction and maintenance of oil fields within the last 25 years and the increase in prices, a combination of complicity by Nigerian politicians and fits dragon by oil companies has for more than a quarter century conspired to keep taxes to the barest minimum, above $20 per barrel. Now, even as the price is some three times the value. He, however, expressed happiness that for the first time, under the amended law, 200 million Nigerians will start to receive a fair return on the surfeit of resources of the land. Ruth Aguela, NT News. Joining me now in the studio is the special advisor to the president on Niger Delta Affairs, Senator Itainan. He's here to give us details of the amended Deep Offshore Act. Senator Itainan, welcome to the studio. Thank you very much. What will you say is the meaning, or what does it mean, uh, to sign this amendment act into law? What does it mean to Nigerians and to Nigeria? You know, Nigeria lost quite so much money. Mm -hmm. And His Excellency Mr. President tried from 2016, 2017, 2018 to get this act passed but it was not passed by the previous legislature. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in the course of it, there was litigation led by River State Government in where they're losing money which ought to have come to them and the, if it came to the federal government. So, and, uh, so what, the, and what the assent to this act has done mm -hmm. is to make sure that at least one, not less than 500 million will be dollars will be made available to the federal government to fund its budget. It is not only 500 million that will come in, but what may be the federal government con um, share to fund the 2020 budget may be just around 500 billion. Again, there is the possibility that Nigeria may have a arrears to recover of about 43 US 43 billion US dollars, which the oil companies and majors are owing Nigeria. In fact, that's about 36 uh, billion dollars as the principal, plus about 7 billion US dollars as interest. A total of 43 billion dollars. Can you shed light, a little light on that? Because I understand yeah. the oil companies are saying Nigeria. That slept, slept. Oh, that's right. Yeah. The 
we did not sleep on our rights. The NNPC and the persons in Nigeria who ought to have done what they ought to have done did not do what they have done, what they ought to have done in time. But it does not mean that that money has to go. We cannot go because that money was generated. And the act says that it should be reviewed. If we didn't review, then it stands at the price, at the law, at the price, it stands at the rate the law had stated it should stand. You know, th th there were uh, percentages that had to be paid. If we didn't review when the oil price exceeded $20 per barrel, there were templates that were used, and the calculation has used those templates, and it amounts to about $43 billion US dollars, and we will be able to get it using the appropriate processes. So how, how, what are the processes now, very quickly? Either litigation, but we will prefer like Mr. President, like the executive normally prefers political solution, some conciliatory approaches to get it done because that's still in Nigeria, that's still producing, and that's still part of its corporate So Some negotiation is on the way. It's on the way. That's yeah, what let's I want very to quickly yeah. look at uh, the, the speed at which, if I can call it so, at which the Nans Assembly uh, passed this. Uh, I think uh, it's a very, act. very commendable. Uh, how do you compare that to the problematic challenges the executive had? In the eight assemblies, uh, I, 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 I will I will say that uh, let that bygone be bygone because I remember clearly mm. the effort that Mr. President got this uh, wanted this bill passed. He had to draft the secretary to the government of the federation to come in and work with us in the process. And the bill was sent to the National Assembly on the fourth of June, two thousand and eighteen. Despite that, there were earlier processes and even up to the end of the listing. But again, there was another problem that happened with the National Assembly should also not be held. The Minister of Petroleum Resources, I want to apologize, and the officers of the ministry refused to come when we made effort for them to come. The Senate President now, Dr. Ahmad Lawan, was the Senate leader. We arranged meetings several times for them to come and brief the Senate leader on the import if, and the House leader now, the Speaker now, was the House leader mm. on the import of this bill. Okay, if you are not coming, send us a written brief so that we can properly present this bill on the floor. They refused, failed, neglected, and that is how, uh, that is how other than other matters, the bill could not be presented because the executive, the officers, did not come forward. Nor did they even, but that is why. Now moving the, forward, let's look at yes. the synergy and the, the yes, har yes. harmony that now exists between the two uh, arms of government. Moving forward, what I can think you this say is why every legislature, sh every executive, should do everything to make sure that it is working harmoniously with the legislature, and the legislature are, emerges in a way that is will work together with the uh, executive. So I want to congratulate the National Assembly, congratulate Mr. President. Mr. President, again, particularly because the bill was just concurred last week by the House of Representatives, and today he has assented to it. And it shows the extent to which the federal government and Mr. President is responsive to any, any matter that relates to fiscals, particularly to fund the budget and raise more money for Nigerian economy. Senator Itaina, thank you so much for coming to our studio and shedding this very, very bright light to the, the legislature, executive relations, and of course to the import and details uh, contained in the amendment of the Deep Show Amendment Act. Thank, thank you, you so very much. Thank you very much. Moving on now, let's remind you that President Muhammad Buhari's four-day engagement in Saudi Arabia ended last Saturday, but already there are visible signs that his extensive talks with King Salman bin Abdulaziz and his son, the Crown Prince Muhammad bin Abd Salman, is impacting on the economy of both countries. Benny Adams packaged that report and now reports. The four-day future investment initiative tagged Divorce in the Desert offered President Wari a platform to interface with global leaders, investors, and innovators, alongside President Momodo Yusufu of Niger Republic and Uhuru Kenyatta of Kenya. They deliberated on what's next for Africa, how investment and trade will transform the continent into the next great economic success story. President Wari shared his administration's vigorous implementation of key reforms in the oil and gas sector, agriculture, 
and the country's vast human resources. U.S. Treasury Secretary at the event raised the possibility of investing in Nigeria under the new United States International Development Finance Corporation, which provides $60 billion for investments in developing nations. The president told the Americans that Nigeria will leverage on the U.S. facility to address current challenges confronting her power sector, as well as general upgrade of infrastructure. The game changer for the Nigerian delegation was the iconic meeting with the Crown Prince, Mohammed Ibn Salman, who in a special gesture, visited President Bwari in his abode. And like Aramco, he asked, what can they do to assist Nigeria? Adding that Nigeria is already destined to be one of the top 20 economies of the world and reiterated Saudi's eagerness to support Nigeria to the top. Before he left the kingdom, both leaders reviewed the historically strong and friendly relations between the two countries and looked at ways through which it can be formalized and therefore agreed to set up a joint saudi nigeria strategic council to be made up of government officials and businessmen from both countries and to focus on economic growth and development investment in oil and non-oil sectors and security cooperation Vice President Yemi Oshibajo has also been assuring investors of the federal government's determination to collaborate with investors to create the best possible environment for business in the sector to thrive. The Vice President was speaking at the opening of the Nigeria-Canada Investment Summit in Abuja. Here is State House Correspondent Jide Onifari with details. This is the second Nigeria-Canada Investment Summit, the first being in 2018. And as Vice President Yemi Oshimba mentioned in the 2018 edition, the summits are an important process in deepening the socio-economic ties between Nigeria and Canada. Both governments and business communities realize that there is enormous potential in the relationship the Vice President observes. This 2019 edition of the summit will be focusing on agriculture, education, energy, healthcare, housing and mining. These are some of the areas Vice President Oshimbajo says the country has identified as crucial to the success of the nation's economic recovery and growth plan. The next few years promise to be exciting for industry, trade and commerce in Nigeria, especially with the coming into force of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreements. Nigeria remains the most, the, the most logical destination for reaping maximum benefit from these agreements. Consequently, we've devoted considerable attention to improving the Nigerian business environment and we have, by, by all accounts, recorded notable success. We are determined not just to ensure that we keep to the plans that we put in place, but that we encourage all of our partners to work with us. Bilateral trade is said to be in the order of $984 million. Canada has committed to investing $1.1 billion to help Canadian businesses access new markets with the objective of increasing Canada's international exports by 50% by the year 2025. It is my hope that this new policy, combined with increasingly adventurous Canadian companies like we see here today, um, will mean more trade and investment with Nigeria. Nigeria and Canada are in discussions to modernize the existing BIT following the review of the model BIT for both countries. Over the past three years, considerable efforts have been put towards building Nigeria into a destination of choice for foreign direct investment. For an investor to come and invest in a country, there must be that enabling environment for him to invest. And already the government has created that enabling environment. We had a vision that the vehicle we are creating will be the bridge that will officially and permanently connect trade, investment, and by extension, cultural opportunities between Nigeria and Canada. Recent Canadian investors' engagements in Nigeria will be highlighted and other discussions in the next two days are expected to be beneficial to both countries. Nabuja, Chite Onifade, NT News. Although it appears we have stabilized now, but we were experiencing some little challenges a while ago. We apologize for those challenges. Players in urban development have added their voices to 
calls for public-private sector collaboration in addressing the housing deficits in Nigeria, especially in the delivery of decent and affordable accommodation. Doe India reports that they made this decision at the eighth meeting of the National Council on Lands, Housing and Urban Development in Abuja. Food, clothing and shelter are the basic needs of life. The absence of one affects the average well-being of anyone. Taufik Adigun is a father of two and a commercial driver who operates within the Abuja metropolis. There is, however, a limitation to meeting his daily targets, housing. He can't stay for Abuja now because accommodation is very high. He can't avoid it. Taufik's story is similar to that of millions of Nigerians whose income cannot guarantee a decent accommodation for them and their families. An online report in 2015 revealed that Nigeria has about 70 million housing deficits. About 900,000 housing units is projected in the next 10 to 15 years. But how well Nigeria can meet this huge financial demand especially in the light of the recent economic realities is amongst wealth participants at this event we consider to ascertain the exact housing deficit these are via the population so that government should now strengthen uh, existing policies uh, to construct more houses whether we have adequate uh, land resources to be able to produce enough housing for our citizens. Yes. To reduce the housing deficit, deficit that is uh, that is ongoing. Their resolution is expected to touch on the demands of Taufik Adigun and all the Nigerians concerned in Abuja doing dear anti news. From housing to education, the sector is one bedeviled with lots of challenges. Well, it appears that challenge or those challenges may soon come to an end, as the National Council on Education has decided to confront the challenges head on. Kinsley Amajiri reports on the theme of the 64th National Council on Education, which is holding in Port Harcourt. Millions of graduates from the nation's various institutions of learning roam about the streets seeking paid employment. Majority of them find it difficult to fend for themselves when they fail to secure white-collar jobs. Part of the challenges over the years is attributed to the quality and content of the education they acquired. This informed the decision for this five days conference spearheaded by the Federal Ministry of Education in collaboration with other relevant stakeholders. We are carrying out a fundamental restructuring of our educational system. We have about these 30 fortresses within which to take one and is compulsory. The River State Government also shares in this national concern. The state government tax the conference to reinvent the educational system such that upcoming generation of graduates can produce what the nation needs. You have the responsibility to make education truly functional. Key to actualizing this objective is the need to build capacity among the teaching staff towards transferring the relevant skills to the learners. Delegates are expected to formulate new policy blueprint to be ratified and adopted nationwide in Port Harcourt, Kingsley, Amagiri, NTA News. This network news is broadcast live on the NTA. We have more news after the break. Join us again. Thank you for remaining with the network news. The payment of severance allowance to legislative aides of the 8th Assembly, who served between 2015 and 2019, has been a contentious issue. In a bid to resolve the matter, the National Assembly leadership and management has met with the Minister of Finance. National Assembly correspondent Ikechosun Court now brings us the details. It's been a period of legislative and executive meetings at the National Assembly. The Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Zainab Ahmed, has been one of the regular visitors to the legislative arm of government in the last two months. The latest visit by the Minister 
the Director General of the Budget Office and the Management of the Revenue Mobilization and Location and Fiscal Commission was to meet with the leadership and management of the National Assembly on how to pay former legislative aides their severance allowance. Leadership of the National Assembly and the management of the National Assembly, led by Clark to the National Assembly, Sani Omolori, are bothered and committed to addressing the problem. And we are talking about the aids of 2000. And 15 to 2019 who have completed their work. It is only fair that we do that, give them what is due to them. So we realized there was need to bring on board for this discussion the uh, Ministry of Finance, National Assembly Service Commission as well. The meeting eventually went into a closed door from the National Assembly, Ignatius Mkwo, NTN News. Still at the National Assembly, the Senate Committee on Judiciary, Human Rights and Legal Matters has advocated improved funding for the judiciary to ensure that the, the independence of that arm of government. This was during the screening of judicial officers for confirmation as chief judge of the Federal, Cap Federal High Court and President National Industrial Court. National Assembly correspondent Vivian Idekbefo reports that one of the remaining two nominees in the governing board of the NNDC, NDDC, I beg your pardon, Aisha Mohammed, representing the Northwest Geopolitical Zone, has also been screened by the Senate Committee on Niger Delta. Justices John Soho and Benedict Nanyip are nominees by President Muhammad Buhari to fill the offices of the Chief Judge of the Federal High Court and President National Industrial Court. The Chairman Senate Committee on Judiciary, Okbayemi Bamidele, stressed that the Ninth Assembly is committed to the ideals of harmony among the arms of government. He harped on the need to improve on the welfare of the judiciary, adding, that Nigeria cannot afford to be relegated by the international community. I will once again emphasize on the need for collaboration on what has become a collective vision. The vision of our committee, the vision of the Ninth Senate, and no doubt the vision of Nigerians who are convinced no democracy can grow or can survive with a compromised judiciary. The committee also urged judicial officers to evolve reforms that will rebrand the country's judiciary. In another development, the Senate Committee on Finance shifted its meeting with the Central Bank of Nigeria to enable the CBN governor, Godwin Emefele, to appear in person. From the National Assembly, Vivian Idekbe for NTA News. Minister of State in the FCT, Ramatu Tijani Aliu, has expressed concern over what she described as total neglect of projects to the area councils of the territory. Ramatu Aliu met this known while on a tour of facilities of Kujia Area Council. She specifically was appalled at the dilapidating state of Kujia Mini Stadium. If I remember, reports. The Minister of State, FCT, Ramatutijani Aliu, who described the Kujemini Stadium as one of the non-existing projects in the council, reiterated the commitment of President Buhari's administration's drive towards completion of all abandoned projects, adding that the FCT administration may consider the option of public-private partnership arrangement to complete some of the identified projects. The stadiums are very necessary in a developed place, and we are also uh, expecting to give a befitting face to the sports in the people, you know, for the people of Kujé and FCT. While in Kujé Women Development Centre, the Minister of State ordered for immediate use of the centre, noting that some of the equipment are not put to use. Earlier, the chairman, Kujia Area Council, Abdullahi Suleiman Sabu, said, despite the paucity of funds, the council has in the past six months been able 
to empower the youth through provision of entrepreneurial tools and provision of functional and effective free healthcare delivery. We are repositioning the administration for a positive delivery system. On the recent incidents of kidnapping and robbery experienced in the council, the chairman said his administration is specifically working hard to stop the incessant attacks and kidnapping in Peggy community. He however stressed the need for accessible roads to move farm produce from farm to other parts of the FCT. In Abuja, Ifani, Isumba, and News. A new crime fighting police squad known as Operation Desert Inter Intervention Squad has been uh, introduced to the security operations in Yoruba State. Inspector General of Police Mohamed Ademu inaugurated the new outfit and also took delivery of 30 brand new Hilux vehicles, office and residential accommodation for the special squad, donated by Yoruba State Governor Mai Mala Buni in Damatru, the state capital. Yunusa Suleiman now reports. Inspector General of Police Mohamed Abubakar Ademu led a high powered security personnel delegation including EFCC Chairman Ibrahim Magu, DIG Operations, AIGs on 12, six Commissioner of Police in Northeast States, among others, for the inauguration of a special operation, Desert Intervention Squad, tagged Haba Maza in Yobe State. As the Inspector General of Police, Mohamed Abubakar, and Governor May Malabuni jointly perform the program, they both emphasize on the need for synergy and collaboration in fighting crimes and insurgency in the state. The Excellency has also demonstrated his determination to prioritize security in other states. By so doing, a worthy case in security management has been set. It is for this reason that we thought it was necessary to work together with Nigerian police to set up a rapid response squad that could deploy anywhere in the state to tackle these challenges and threats. Apart from the 30 brand new 4x4 wheel drive Helox vehicles donated, Yobe State Government also provided a furnished office and a residential accommodation for the Operation Habermaza Squad to help them operate effectively. Demonstration in advanced drill was performed by the newly formed Operation Desert Intervention Squad. Yobe Suleiman, NTA News. A two-day capacity retreat has begun for commissioners, designate, advisors, and permanent secretaries to equip them with skills that will enable them to deliver the change agenda in Gombe State. Emmanuel Akila reports that it is the first time in the history of the state that such an event is taking place. Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Boss Mustafa, was among speakers who admonished the participants to be committed to duty when they eventually are sworn into public office. The Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Boss Gida Mustafa, arrived at Gombe and joined other guests at the Banquet Hall Government House Gombe for the opening of the retreat designed to expose the Commissioner's designate, advisors and permanent secretaries to the policy direction of the Inouye Haya administration. That at the end of this retreat, ministerial mandates will be developed, which will be signed by the commissioners and the permanent secretaries in the various ministries, which will hold them accountable to the people and at quarterly basis be expected to report back to the people and to the government. Governor Enwa Yahaya listed the projects inherited and those initiated by his administration for the new public office holders to have a clear picture of the tax at hand. I urge you to key into the roadmap of policies, programs and projects that will lift the masses of our people out of poverty and put them on the road to prosperity as contained in our campaign manifesto. You must be loyal, you must be dedicated to the duties assigned to you and also be able to carry along our people. Speakers took turns to advise the participants to apply themselves to the responsibilities of their would-be offices and to help the state government fit into the overall policies and programs of the federal government. The participants include 21 commissioners designate screened by the State House of Assembly. In Gombe, Emmanuel Akila, NTA News. You're watching the Network News on the NTA. Let's now join Michael Olali in Lagos for more on the news. Hello, Michael. 
Hello, Mohammed, and welcome to Lagos. Following the collapse of a part of a two-story building that was under construction at the Global Road, Ikoi, Lagos, the State Emergency Management Agency has pulled down the structure and four others cited by the same owner to advert further casualty. Annie Danos who visited the scene reports. Until the 1st of November 2019, a building under construction was standing right behind me. But today, however, it has been completely pulled down after a part of it collapsed, killing one of the construction workers on duty. That has also led to the pulling down of several other structures still in the same premises, owned by the same person. The buildings which were under construction at Glover Court, Ikoyi, Lagos, were pulled down because they failed integrity tests conducted by the Solid Material Testing Agency and Physical Planning Ministry. And that's why we are talking tough. The building, that place, will be forfeited to the government when we look at it again with the tough factors. Obtaining a development permit doesn't mean you are doing the right thing. Once you obtain a development permit from the state government to build, you have to ensure that the Lagos State Building Control Agency is informed that you are when you intend to commence work. In the past two weeks, there have been reported cases of building collapse in different areas of Lagos, that is Aja, Magodo, Ojuelewa, and this recent one in the Koyi area of Lagos. Nigerians only hope and pray that relevant agencies will take adequate steps to ensure that contractors follow due process. In Lagos, Annie Daniels, NTA News. The Nigerian Navy has demonstrated its capability to protect the nation's maritime assets and area of responsibility in the Gulf of Guinea for economic prosperity. Dotu Guyami reports that the five-day exercise tagged Grand African Nemo was held in collaboration with the French Navy. Keeping the seas and maritime environment safe is a task that the Nigerian Navy undertakes with every sense of responsibility. Evolving challenges and security threats in the maritime space, however, calls for better information sharing among regional maritime awareness capability centers across Gulf of Guinea nations, which was the reason for exercise Grand African Nemo 2019, to which Nigeria committed four vessels and a helicopter. As you practice these things so that uh, in real time when it happens, you know what to do and uh, it improves your effectiveness and efficiency. The aim is uh, to, uh, to train together, to, uh, to share our experience, uh, to improve maritime security here in the zone. To assess the proficiency of its men in carrying out vessel boarding, search and seizure operations, this simulation by Nigerian Navy Special Boat Service Operatives on board participating French vessels was a display of professionalism. I'm very satisfied with the level of competence in which my officers and men have discharged uh, their responsibilities and duties. Exercises such as this ensure that officers and men of the Nigerian Navy are kept abreast of their roles and duties, as well as latest strategies in tackling maritime threats and other forms of insecurity. From the Nigerian Navy ship Babana, Dotson Okunyemi, NTA News. That's a contribution from Lagos. Network News continues after this timeout. Please stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to our Abuja studio. It's time to talk business and Mopulang Nakong is here with me in the studio and will tell us more on the economy. Hello Mopulang, what is trending on the business sector? Thank you. A lot is trending, particularly uh, the excitement in business circles that the president has assented to the deep offshore bill. Yeah, so, countries. but we'll talk about other issues. The African Economic Congress has opened in Abuja with discussions targeted at building the economy on the continent. Business News spoke with some key players at the event on how to increase international trade for Africa. Economic theory has proven that when countries trade with each other based on their best competitive advantage, at the end of the day, it's a win-win for everyone. Africa today is 
experiencing a resurgent interest from countries around the world. How do we benefit from this interest? The best way we can benefit from this interest is to unite our economies, explore our resources, and see how this relationship can also ignite a new industrialization for our continent. In order to increase food sufficiency and income generation, the federal government sees farming equipment from the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development will be sold to farmers at 50% discount. The Minister of State for Agriculture and Rural Development, Mustafa Shehuri, in a statement said that the move is to show government's determination at improving the production capacity of farmers. Meanwhile, at the close of trade this Monday, the stock market wore a green outlook, opening the week positive. The NAC All Share Index went up 0.41% as market capitalization increased to 12.851 trillion naira. Investors traded 368 million shares, valued at 2.7 billion naira, in 3,475 deals. The top gainers for the day were Stanbic, GTB, and UBA, while Unilever, MRS, and Interbrew led the losers. We now go over to our Kaduna Network Center, where Zule is standing by. Hello, Zule. Thank you for joining us in Kaduna. The Minister of State for Agriculture, Mustafa Baba Shehuri, has directed the National Livestock and Pest Control Center in Kaduna to conclude arrangement for the training and release of some equipment in the custody to the farmers at subsidized rate. The minister gave the directive during a facility tour of the center. Mohamed Umar Ajengi has the report. The National Livestock and Pest Control Center is saddled with the responsibility of supervising agricultural projects, training of farmers, and service link between them and government. This equipment here has been procured by the federal government to be sold to farmers at 25% subsidy. Director Northwest Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, Olabi Martin Lisegun, says the sudden rise in exchange rate affected the process. We need to conduct training for the farmers as need be, depending on the complexity of such equipment. And some of them that the rate of exchange is affecting. The government is working right now to review the price and make it competitive because we sell our subsidy rate here to ensure that the farmers adopt technology. The minister directed the center to speed up action in ensuring that the facilities get to the real owners to enable them to meet up with the desire of Buhari administration for increased food production. These uh, equipment are not meant to be dumped here. They should be in the field. We we'll definitely work towards seeing that uh, these equipment goes into the hands of the, uh, the right people that it was meant for. The success story of rice production across the country, the minister says, has proven that agriculture is the answer to Nigeria's growth and development needs. In Kaduna, I'm Muhammad Umar Ajingi, NTA News. The appeal court in Kaduna has reserved judgment until the 7th of November in the case of Governor Nasir Ahmed Arufai of the All Progressives Congress and the People's Democratic Party's governorship candidate Isa Ashuru Kudang. Abdullahi Muhammad reports that the appeal court took the decision after adoption of briefs by counsels to the appellants and respondents. The appeal filed by the PDP governorship candidate in the 2019 elections in Kaduna State was on the heels of a dismissal of the case by the election tribunal, pleading the five-man panel of judges to consider the appeal and nullify the election of Governor Nasser Ahmed Arufai of Kaduna State. Wole Olani Pekun, son, described the evidences brought before the election tribunal as uncontestable facts. He wonders why the tribunal outrightly threw out reliable confessions of 135 witnesses, urging the appeal court to review the adopted briefs and note the critical point in passing judgment. Counsel to the first, second, and third respondents, Governor Nasser Ahmed Erufai, 
the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, and the All Progressives Congress, APC, were emphatic in pointing out that the election tribunal gave all the witnesses brought before it a fair hearing with expert analysis of the evidences proving it to be grossly contradictory. We feel that uh, we have been able to advance very superior arguments before the appellate uh, court to show that the election of Mullah Amaz Erufa is in conformity with the relevant provisions of the Electoral Act. The counsels to the three respondents urged the panel of judges to dismiss the case and uphold the judgment of the tribunal. The appeal is expected to lapse on the 7th of November, and that is why the five-man panel of judges decided to fix that day for the judgment. In Kaduna, Abdullah Mohammed, NT News. And that's our beat from here. Network News continues after the break. of Niger Delta Development Commission of the Citizens and Region is the focus this week on the 88 Tuesday Live. The program promises to be incisive and informative. Join us at 10.30 p.m. Nigeria says it will relax the restriction imposed on its land borders after agreement on preconditions to be presented at the tripartite meeting between Nigeria, Niger and Benin Republic. Correspondent Aliu, Osman Aliu reports that this was disclosed by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Geoffrey Oyama, after a meeting with relevant state authorities. Unlike what it used to be, when anything bad or dangerous to human life, particularly consumables and of recent arms smuggling, find easy ways to Nigeria, federal government says it is over. Now there are conditions to regulate movement of goods and humans, which Nigeria is adopting in line with global standards. Imports coming to Nigeria, warehouses along borders, and people coming without valid documents are issues which the federal government scrutinize. We will now insist on proper recognized packaging of those goods. No longer will we have, you know, uh, uh, goods in all shapes and sizes um, just going through uh, the borders. And they must be escorted from the port directly to the entry points, designated entry points on the Nigerian borders. Two weeks from now, a meeting will be held for Nigeria's neighbors to understand and agree with the preconditions for Nigeria makes our land borders available for movement of goods and people. In Abuja, Usman Aliu, NTA News.